Hey, I'm Nick Boy, and welcome to Pocket. And today I chat to Australian indie dev Matt Trobiani. Matthew Trobiani is the one man band behind Adelaide based indie studio team Fractal Alligator. His game Hacknet has been so successful, he's been able to quit his day job developing defense simulation software and start developing games full time. Matt, thank you for joining me. Congratulations on Hacknet's success. Talk me through the first few days after launch. It's actually been pretty ridiculous. This is my fourth convention since it's launched in about two months and my eighth patch. Uh, it's just me on the team and also like starting a business and everything. So first few days all the way through to pretty much now have just been like non-stop. But were you just sort of sitting there like looking at whatever email Steam sends you to go like your game is actually doing well? <laughs> Steam doesn't send you an email, you bastards. They you get sales figures and stuff, right? But I mean, trying not to check them. I like deliberately slept in on the day it came out. I made some estimates the night before and how I think it'll do and it got price lows pretty quickly. Like for the first month and then like a couple of hours in, like, oh, maybe you should have, maybe you should change them a bit. And just, uh, yeah, trying not to freak out, trying not to, like worry too much about negative reviews. Did you see the first negative review it got? No, what did they say? Got, no graphics? <laughs> I got 39 positive reviews and the first negative one I got was, why are you looking at the negative reviews? 10 out of 10, best game ever made. Like, on the one hand, like, nice. On the other hand, you're messing with my ratio. So. <laughs> did you think that a sort of niche, tiny game of the sort of weird scale that you made could ever be so successful? I think every game developer thinks they're making a game that's going to be really successful, so obviously I was really hoping, but I was kind of pretty prepared for Steam reviews to be like slamming me and uh, people not to get it and not, not to find a big audience, at least not at the start, and sort of hoped on finding a bunch of people that really liked the game over the course of a few years, but for it to be picked up and loved so immediately by so many people was just way more than I could have asked for, so it was crazy. And all the reports are that you've sort of just quit your job and you're now on a beach in Tahiti somewhere all the time. But I imagine you're actually insanely busy, like more so than you were when you had an actual job. Yeah, way busier now than I've ever been in like a real job. And people will come up and say like, oh, so what are you working on next? What's, what's your next game? I'm like, I don't have time to think about a next game. I'm doing like translations and Mac Linux support and uh, multiplayer. Multiplayer hacking. Yeah, yeah, multiplayer. The first prototype of the game was multiplayer only, 1v1. So uh, yeah, some cool stuff coming. You mentioned that this is like your fourth convention since the game launched. What's the experience like for you bringing it to something like PAX? Uh, I brought it to PAX Prime as one of the ones before this and Tokyo Game Show. I think this convention in particular is really cool because the indie section is amazing. Um, a lot of the people are great and this is my favorite setup we've done so far. This sort of level of feedback and like response you get from people just coming playing your game and even if they really like it, you can see where they have trouble because there are so many people who run into the same thing. And by bringing Hacknet specifically to a lot of conventions before, that like is what made it playable from the early game. So that was that was like your um, your testing phase for it. Yeah, yeah. So it's a it was a really hard game to teach. I sort of made this huge game, then realized you need to be a computer scientist to play it. And by bringing it to conventions, I got a lot of people to like come through and see where they got stuck and see how it wasn't doing well enough for the tutorial and that helped the game so much. I can imagine because it's kind of like you bring it here where it's all people who play video games all the time and if they can't solve your puzzle then like the general public is really going to have a hard time with it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And especially getting to talk to people now that's out and a lot of that refinement's in place and seeing it do a lot better and a lot fewer people get stuck is so great. And I like your setup here because I feel like television tells me that hackers have multiple screens around all the time. Uh, what do you think appeals people to this sort of thing as opposed to glitzy giant wargaming explosions. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not, not going to lie, if I could have the glitzy wargaming booth I would, but uh, I really like this setup just because I, I feel like there's something really cool and personal and like hackery about like punching over the laptop, but at, uh, in Tokyo we had that and then people would be like crowding around like pulling people away to sort of look over their shoulders, so we want like the screens above them. And I'm like, let's just get more screens, more screens all the time. I'm regretting we only have six. So I played Hacknet for Pocket, and by the end I felt like I was just a total badass hacker. Is that the sort of feedback that you've been getting from most people? Yeah, a lot. I actually designed the game with the core idea not being to try and make something fun, but to try and make you feel like a hacker. Like, that's number one priority. And I made like a lot of sacrifices to the game design to make that happen, but it's so awesome to see it really working. You said that multiplayer is coming for Hacknet. Do you have any further plans? Like, are there sequel plans or something? Or you're just maintaining the game now? 
Uh, well, stuff that's coming up next is like Mac Linux is up next, and then after that, localization. The game I thought was going to be untranslatable, but after some discussions with some really talented translators in Japan, we think we're going to be able to do some really interesting stuff. Can I ask why you thought the game was untranslatable? Is it because like hacking is different in different places, or it's really complicated because a lot of the text that comes out is generated. Uh, so it's not like you just have a file that you can pass to someone and then you translate that, then the game's in a different language. Uh, a lot of it's like produced and is uh, like ordered in a certain way by what you type in. And it's very dynamic like that in a lot of places and translating those sort of things is really hard. So originally I thought it wasn't going to be workable, but apparently all terminals in the world are in English anyway, so don't even need to bother. So obviously you said people keep going like, what's the sequel, what's the sequel, yep. what are you doing next? I'm not going to ask that, but like your plans now are just full-time game development for the rest of your life. I mean, that's the dream, right? Yeah. Um, I think you should probably rest assured that I would love to do a sequel, probably more than anyone even wants it, so that'll probably happen at some point. But uh, I should probably do some other, other experiments first. There's a lot of things I want to do as well. Well, congratulations. The game's just so cool, and it's so awesome to find like an Australian developer who's had like crazy success on something that is so niche but so awesome at the same time. So like, I'm just so happy for you. Uh, and thank you very much for hanging out for us today. That's it for today's episode of Pocket. Nick Boy out. Thank you very much. Say, 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 say out. Say out. Say out. Not out. There you go.